All right. So I, I definitely have some things I need to send off from a recording perspective and links that people have seen sent me. So I'm uh, I've just been lazy procrastinating, so I haven't sent it out. So I would definitely do it this week. Hopefully, uh, I plan on doing it. Um, what I wanted to talk about is just kind of do a quick review of things that we've done so far, and then take it to this next step with creating malware. And then you're going to hear this term called FUD, which is um, fully undetectable malware. So that's what we're going to look at today. And we've been going through this whole process of creating malware and then it being detected just to kind of show you the steps that are involved, some of the tools and, and how difficult it is to create malware and how easy it is to create malware and to be detected by by Windows. So you, you have to worry about antivirus companies and then on top of antivirus companies, you have to have you have to worry about uh, endpoint uh, detection systems and response systems such as um, CrowdStrike and Cisco AMP and uh, Silent. So what I want to talk about initially was um, we created um, our first exploit and we used um, a product called IceCast. So we ran an in-map scan on a host computer, which is a Linux host, I mean, a, a Windows host. And that Windows host, we did in-map and we found out there was an application that was running IceCast, okay? And so we found that IceCast is already built into Metasploit. So Metasploit is a framework that has um, exploits already made or packaged so you don't have to spend your time trying to compile it with the code and the source code. So Metasploit already had one that's called IceCast header that we could use to take advantage of the IceCast application running on Windows. So basically we had a Kali, uh, Kali Linux machine and we run hack a Windows 10 machine running the IceCast applications. Because when you look at applications, one of the attack vectors is the application that's running on the system or the operating system itself. So once we found the exploit, then we need to send a payload to that particular host. Now the payload was how we would interact with the system. So since it was a Windows machine, we wanted to use a payload called Meterpreter. And the Meterpreter is kind of like a mini program or uh, application in itself. Because when you hack a machine, you have something called shell, which is the command line prompt. But Meterpreter is its own individual command line prompt or shell that I can run on top of the operating system underlying OS. So I'm gonna run this Meterpreter because it's gonna give me a bunch of extra tools or utilities to use or commands. I wanna do a reverse TCP connection because once I compromise this Windows machine with my exploit, my payload, once it's on that particular machine, is just going to do a call home to my Linux machine. So that call home is just this reverse, and we're using TCP. Now, when I create my payload, um, there's multiple options to use. But basically, I want to use my remote host because once it's Kali Linux machine sends it to the payload, it has to call home. And then my local host is basically the IP address of the machine that I'm compromising, which is housing the IceCast application. Okay. So these were the things that we did. We had IceCast, we had it up and running. Now the problem was when we turned on antivirus, I mean the, the Windows firewall, it didn't work. All right. So we talked about how to turn off the Windows firewall from a command line perspective. And then we started looking at, well, how can I send a package or uh, hack a person's machine that has the Windows firewall or one of these other uh, CrowdStrike or, or Cisco AMP on the endpoint? So then we started looking at creating the file. Okay. So in the process of creating this file,
we use something a little bit different. So we use this program called MS Venom. The platform that we were using was Windows. We're still using the same Windows Meterpreter session. Okay. And now, um, no, P is for actually payload, I'm sorry. And the platform was Windows down here. And then it's 386. My file type is going to be executable. And my L host, my local host, um, is 192.168.1.1. So this is a machine that um, I'm compromising. I'm trying to compromise, right? So, and then I have this port. Actually, this should be the host of my Kali Linux, and then the port is the port that is listening to. And then my output is this particular file. Now, in, in theory, most executables some companies do allow executables, executables to be downloaded from the internet, but some of them don't. They like to block them because who trusts executables and most of the workstations at an enterprise is locked down. So you don't want people to installing applications that don't have admin rights who have been tested in their uh, development environment, but some companies do. So this is just kind of a walkthrough to get you accustomed to creating a, a um, malware in a file, okay? So once we create this file, you will have to send it to your host and hopefully the host will click on it, okay? So hopefully the Windows guy will click on the file, reverse back to the hacker. Now, part of that, is we need something called a multi-handler, okay? So the multi-handler is basically, I want my machine to listen to that particular port, all right? So you have to have this Kali Linux or the hacker, he has to be listening for incoming connections for that Windows to do that call back home. Okay, so every application has a TCP port or port that is running on. So this is that information here that allows that, that callback. Now, the reason why I'm telling you this is because uh, today we're gonna see another way to do this handler and you can use Netcat as well, but we're not gonna use Netcat. We're gonna use something a little bit different. And we use the MS Venom to create a file. We're gonna use something else to create the file as well. Uh, but we will still test the file by once we have this hacker machine, what we're going to do is on our Kali Linux and the other examples, we were running uh, a web server. So we're going to run this web server to test our payload to make sure it works. But the key this time, we're still going to have our antivirus running to see if it can be detected or not. And then we're going to also uh, walk through of uh, testing multiple antiviruses to determine if something is compromised or not. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, so. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, so I just joined and I think I missed uh, the introduction part. So these three are the uh, uh, payloads that you've created, like a malware or something? Correct. So we were just kind of walking through uh, a couple of previous exercises that we've done uh, to, to talk about what we did. We were going down a certain path, kind of a series of different um, instructional how to create malware and uh, on Windows 10, and then we had a couple of speakers to come in, and then uh, I had to counsel class a couple of times. So just, just to backtrack on it, we created a payload, or we used an export on the application that was running on a Windows 10 that was IceCast, and it could have been any application. It was just that IceCast was the application that had a vulnerability, and with the vulnerability, there was an export already in the Metasploit framework, which is prepackaged in, in Kali Linux. So we just used that because it was there to get in the habit of using 
um, not exploit. Now, uh, in addition to that, we moved on to, well, what if I wanted to create a file and send it to a person and then have them click on it? So this was the process of going through creating a file, having them click on it, and seeing what happens. In process of creating that file for the person to click on for that callback, you definitely need to create what we call a handler or a listener. So sometimes you'll hear uh, this listener is, is similar to a command and control that once a, a hacker or an adversary compromises a machine, he has to send it instructions. So they get the instructions from uh, the command and control. You'll see sometime abbreviated C2C. So this listener is similar to that C2C, uh, C2C command and control because now I'm using this to control my import. Okay. Okay, so this is the way to maintain persistence? Uh, no, we, we haven't talked about that yet. Uh, but, a, but a good question, because once you have this connection, even it's with the IceCast way I'm using Metasploit in a prepackage, or even if I'm using a file, I still have to deal with persistence. So we haven't talked about persistence yet, and we haven't talked about elevating privileges yet. Okay. okay? All right, thank you so much. Yeah, so that's that's going to be as we continue on this path. We'll talk about how to maintain persistence, lateral movement, and um, um, how to go un undevoided. I mean, undetected. So this is what we did. It's kind of a recap of the the previous exercise that we've done. Any more questions? Let me check the uh, chat. Okay. So now what I'm going to do I have my Windows 10 machine and I got my Windows 10 machine from um the link that I sent out in the the invite which is from the Microsoft Development Center and then I have my Kali Linux Now one thing to point out um when we went through particularly these two it didn't work because of the windows firewall and then we started going against uh always having the windows firewall on just to make sure you get you guys get to see what actually happens okay and when individuals are trying to compromise people you know they have their lab environment anyway to test out the code and you'll see that with uh, what we're about to do today so I have my, my Kali Linux, my Windows 10. My Windows 10 has the firewall. It's up and running. And now what I'm going to do is uh, use We're going to use two things. So, one is going to be a platform called uh, Wine. Okay, not the wine you drink, but for those individuals that love Linux, if you have a Windows application and you want to run a Windows application on a Linux system, there's this software program called Wine. So you see there's multiple installed documents on how to install Wine on Kali Linux or Linux in general. That way I can run my uh, Windows application in the window, uh, my Windows application on a Linux machine in kind of a, you would say a virtualized environment, but it's not really a virtualized environment or a Docker container that we talked about previously, but it's own standalone application. So I'm tricking the system to run this application that's actually Windows with the Windows libraries. Okay. In addition to that, I'm going to run a program called Veil. Veil Evasion. And we talked about this a little bit, but this is another way to create a file. So we can use MSF Venom, but we also can use something called Veil Evasion 
um, and here's the framework for it. So these are the two things that we're going to use today. So I'm going to start off with Macaulay Linux. Uh, and keep in mind now, because of the way Kali Linux is set up, you have to run the sudo command. So I just want to take note of my IP address, which is 11.11.4. .11 uh, my IP address for my Windows system is 11.11.5. But in the words of Ronald Reagan, we're going to trust and verify. So let me log on just to verify. So in Linux, I mean Windows is IP config and Linux is if config. So yes, 11, 11 at five. Okay. So what I want to do now is if I want to run or install Wine, pretty self-explanatory. I won't talk about it, but you're going to be using the Linux sudo app get install Wine basically. Um, what I'll do when I send out the WebEx recording, I'll put the links to install it or the instructions to install it. So now what I'm going to do, I'm going to type veil. It's going to run. I want to run the evasion tool, so it's number one, but I also want to make sure that it's updated. So I'm just going to click on update. All right. So now you see I get an error message. Quick quiz. Why did I get this error message? Pseudo? Yes. And I was just about to offer people $50 to tell me the answer, so I'm glad I didn't. So, what I'm going to do yeah. now, I'm going to quit. I'm going to do pseudo. And what do you want to do? Remember, every error message makes you a little bit better. So, don't be afraid to make mistakes, particularly in the virtual environment. Okay. So, when you look at the clues, one, permission denied to let me know that I didn't have. Um, enough permissions. And then this is the path that was giving me where my permission was denied. At. I'm looking at all this stuff. And then I see something about, are you root? Okay. So we're going to do sudo. All right. So now I get to update it. I already updated, so I'm not going to do that. But uh, since I'm going to create a file and use it to evade antivirus, I'm going to type in one. Okay, use one. And after I do that, I'm just going to list the multiple payloads. There's like 41 of them, as you can see. But I'm going to list the payloads that are available. So, similar to um, the payloads that are in Metasploit, I have auxiliary stuff, I have this C meterpreter. The unique thing about this particular framework or tool is that they'll have the application. So this is something done in PowerShell. This is something used the program language Go, Python, right? So I get to kind of pick and choose what's the underlying program that I'm going to be using to run my interpreter shell to get my, this one is reverse HTTP, or it could be HTTPS, okay? So what I want to do, um, I'm going to use 22. PowerShell reverse TCP, all right? So it's giving me options to actually use. So what I'm going to do is set um, let's go 
my local host IP of the Metasport handler. So I'm still going to use the handler. I'm just going to use it a little bit different this time. And then my, my port. So this is for my call back, my call home to, to function. So we're going to set L host similar to Metasploit 11 at 11 at 11. My IP address was dot four. I'm going to do set L port. Um, 444. So this is my TCP connection that will be listening on my Kali Linux machine to accept this particular callback. All right. So I'm good to go. I'm going to type in generate. All right. So now it's basically telling me enter the name of the output file. I'm just going to say it's test 444. Okay, so it did two things. It created something called a Metasploit resource file, and then it created this bat file. Now, if you guys are long-time Windows users, you remember that um, the most famous Windows bat file back in the day was auto exec bat that was used to boot up the actual system. The bat file is nothing but a collection of scripts. All right, um, or, or commands. But what I want to do, I want to, I'm going to open up a text editor. And I'm going to copy this and put it in my text editor. Because I'm going to use this as reference later. Okay, so I got my two files that I'm going to use. Now, what I'm going to do now, I'm going to create a handler or a listener. I'm not going to use netcat, and I'm not going to use the older method. I'm not going to say older, but the alternative method of this guy. All right, so what I'm going to do is just a little command line kung fu. I'm going to open up you know, my system, my virtual machine is freezing on me. So I didn't like that. I say save the machine. I'm gonna go back and open it up. See if it's better luck. Nope. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to power it off. Because I already know, I, re I already created the files. I already know my resources at. It's four gigs of memory. Let me check the chat while I'm doing this. So the question was, can we use any random port you can?
I typically use like four four. Well, when I'm practicing, I use like four 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 or six 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 because it's easy to remember. But if I was doing something in a while, I would probably use a well-known common port like um, 8080s, particularly since it's a reverse TCP, or 80 or 443. Right. So what I'm going to do is just check. I already know my file was created. I'm just uh, trusting and verifying. So here's the source. And I was just practicing earlier, so you see the 666 in the EVA back. So that's my source file. And then if I go up, this was my resource file. Okay. So I'm going to go back, and we were talking about creating a listener. So the way I'm going to create this listener is I'm going to use MSF console. So normally I would use MSF console to um, open up Metasploit. But what I want to do now is just use MSF console to open up a subsection of Metasploit without, over, without having to do all that multi-handler stuff in the past. So what I'm going to do now is use something, I do the question mark, is MS, MSF console has something called uh, the resource. I didn't want to do all that. <clears throat> and then my resource, I'm going to use my resource file. I think that should be the um, sorry RC. So let me check my um, I put handlers to make sure I spelled anything. Variable lib v e i l output handlers. Okay. So let me do this. Can I find the script? I'll uh, put that. So now I'm going to open up terminal here. That way I know the path is there. And with my child. What I'm going to do just for shits and giggles.
I'm just going to do everything over just in case when it froze. Give me the five, five, five. All right. Okay, so you see it's running in the background, exploit completed, but no session was created because I'm create, I'm gonna get a file, but it lets me know that this Kali or Linux system is listening on port 555. So once the Windows machine gets the, the payload, it's gonna do a callback and it's gonna hit this particular TCP, all right? So now what I'm gonna do I know that I create, I'm going to take this bat file and I want to create it into an executable because I want it to an executable. Now there's multiple ways to do that, but I found this program called bat to executable converter. So it's a zip file, ununzipped it, it's in my downloads. And it's uh, executable. So now what I want to do, I want to run this particular program and tweak that particular batch file into an executable. So I did a right click, I'm going to say open terminal here. So I'm in that, in that directory. So now I want to run wine and I want to run it with, uh, against that program okay so i did sudo to make sure i had the right permissions this is the application which is my windows emulator and then this is the program so i'm going to hit enter put in my username i mean my, my password and now it's to install like a typical windows system and click accept click next uh, i don't even care about a desktop shortcut because it won't work anyway. Now I'm going to launch it. All right. So what I'm going to do now, I want to find that particular program, that batch file. So then I'm going to the roots var bell output and then I want to go to source that batch file now I'm going to open it okay now let me move this over a little bit so this is the batch file so I want to test to make sure that it doesn't that I'll when I run it on Windows, it works. And we've been doing the creating a, um, a web server from a web server, go to my Windows machine and download the actual file. We're gonna do it a little bit differently, right? But when I open up this file that it was created, I see a few things. I see the fact that, um, you know, 
let's just test it so you can see, and then we'll make our changes and test. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna use a program. I can use virus total. If those individuals are not familiar with virus total, it can use it to um, check a file. So I can submit a file and check it against antivirus. So what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna go here, let's choose a file. I'm gonna go to my desktop. We'll do this one. This will give you a, a, an idea. Now, the thing about virus total is that it will send back um, to antivirus companies what was detected or not detected. So you see that one particular file is detected by multiple antivirus companies. I'm scrolling down, here's McAfee. Symantec in a silence. Symantec, oh, these are undetected, but these are the ones that are detected, right? So you see there's a difference. Now, since I just submitted this file, guess what? The score is gonna be completely changed. Now you see Microsoft detected. Let's go to the summary. But if I wanted to check and not have it detected, so basically if I was running uh, Bitdefender Theta, AVG, AVAST, um, it won't, this file won't be detected. Now what happens is the vir virus total is gonna let these companies know, look, here's a new file that wasn't detected. So now they're gonna start becoming a little bit more wiser to that particular file. So I wanna go to a website that doesn't report its findings to the antivirus companies. So there's one called anti-scammy. And another one is called uh, no distribute. There's probably more out there, right? We're gonna use anti scammy We're gonna browse. Can't remember where I put that file. And what I'm going to do, I'm just going to move this file to the desktop if it's not locked for editing. Right, just to make it easy to navigate. All right, so now I'm going to say scan file. Oh, I forgot to do it. Let me convert it first. Sorry, I forgot. So I'm going to file. I'm sorry, convert. I'm going to call it um, test. Five five five. 
All right, so I saved that to the desktop. Now let me go back. And we're just going to see how many antivirus companies should be able to find this particular file without fear of it being detected. So 13 out of 26. Back if he says it's clean. Windows Defender. And I could check with no distribute as well just to see for um, just for sanity check. What I'm going to do is now I'm, I'm going to manipulate that particular file because antivirus companies and these companies, they use a lot of them are just signature based, right? So they know the signatures that Veil or um, MSF Venom uses to create these files. So I want to change some things around in it to make it not look like or be undetectable by the signatures that they have already have established. So what I want to do is go back. And as I'm looking at this particular file, you now it looks like a bunch of gibberish, but I see if processor architecture equals x86. Um, I'm going to do something with PowerShell, blah, blah, blah. I get down else. I see this. Windows 64. So I see this f else. So I know it's not 386 because my machine that I'm trying to compromise is a um, 64 bit. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to delete this, everything from that if statement to this guy. All right. And since it was an if else, I don't need that opening bracket. Oh. And I don't need that. Oh, do. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I just modified the file because it veil and when it created the file and generated it, it had this if else statement to say, okay, if it's 386 or 32 bit or 64 bit, right? That was part of that template, that signature. So I got rid of it. Now I see a bunch of stuff for PowerShell for 64 bit. Now I'm no PowerShell guru. So what I'm gonna do, um, I'm just gonna look at all these other options because I don't know what the hell they are. Okay. So I'm gonna go to Let's do PowerShell. Um, the command options. Okay. All right. So I'm looking at this. Now, I do know that this no P actually means no profile. Is this a shortened, for, shortened version of that abbreviated? None, none I, let's see. Oh, none interactive. Uh, Zach is execution policy. So when it created this file, it didn't, it just used the abbreviated version of this stuff. So if, if you're made with Cisco command line CLI, instead of doing, you know, show run and config, you can just do show run. Okay. So what I'm doing now is, um, I'm just going to write it out. That way, and I don't, when I look at non-interactive, don't present an interactive prompt to the user. I don't really necessarily need that. So what I'm going to do is take the, take that out. Mine is W the window style, so don't want to set a normal W. Um, I'll leave that. So I'm just trying to make changes to the configuration 
that the signatures may um, hone in on. Go back. So let me do execution. I'll see. Windows down, normal hidden. Let me write this out as well. Windows. Okay, so I'm making these changes. And then what I'm going to also do, you know what, I'm going to um, maybe when they're creating this template, it's no profile is first, then the window, then execution policy bypass. So I can possibly change some of the stuff around the order of them, but for now I'm just going to leave them as is. Uh, another thing I'm going to do for this, I'm going to change this current directory to temporary directory, 32-bit. I'm going to slide to 64-bit invisible. Um, I think that's all I'm going to do. I'm going to save it. But I'm also now I'm going to do convert to I'm going to say one test five 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 and click on save. All right, go back to my desktop. Okay, we'll save. Now I'm just going to test from antivirus perspective. So let's go to anti scan me. So this has detected by 13 or 16. So hopefully it will, the number will go down. And one of the things that you don't see when you watch these television shows, you don't see the amount of work that these guys put into creating their malware or creating things in general. And I'm, I'm just using kind of the script kitty way. All right. And we're using this program called bat to, um, executable to actually convert it. Next week, we'll go in yeah. to more to Okay. Next week, we'll go in depth to kind of create um, using Hexit Editor um, and a little bit more C and .NET to create these um, backdoors and executables. So let's. Try this again. So we can do browse. We're gonna scan it. And now we're gonna see how many uh, see what happens. So now 12 of 26. Wasn't a huge difference, right? But Windows 10 Defender said it was clean. Now what we're going to do, let's go to no distributor and see what it says. Go to browse, uh, desktop. We're going to uh, scan file. Okay. All right. My son just came in the room. All right. So there's always going to be trial and error, even when you create this batch file to tweak and change things that are actually in it. Um, I can be satisfied with anti scan me because they're going to use, hopefully, some of the same antivirus as uh, no, no distribute, and there's definitely some of the same antivirus picked up from virus total, right? But the true test of it will be once I send it to that Windows machine. 
and if that Windows machine, if it's going to detect it or not, because I don't know how often these scan engines are actually updated, right? Because it says Windows can find it, but Windows may be able to find it once I um, send it to the machine. All right, well, this is running for the sake of time. We're just going to uh, run it and see. So I'm going to So this particular file, one test five five five, I'm going to put it in my HTML file. So it didn't work when I tried to copy. So now I'm going to do sudo cp1 test and paste the path. Okay. So now we can double check. It's in there. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna create a web service running on my Apache, have my Windows machine navigate to it, download the file and see if it works. Oh, no distributor timed out. All right. So to do that, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna go to open up another terminal And in this terminal, what I'm going to do, I'm going to start the web server for Apache. So sudo so service Apache to start. All right. So Apache is running as my web server. I want to make sure my I don't need this anymore. Well, I want to make sure my handler is still running. I don't need this anymore. That's good. All right, I don't see my handler running, so I'm going to start that again. So it's already been used, which is good. I just missed it off the uh, with my windows being open, too many windows. So let me go to my Windows machine. Eleven at eleven at eleven. All right. So this is the default page for Apache. So I know my web server is up and running because I get the default web page. So now let me go to one test 555.exe. 
Okay. Now, this is just a simple way to test one of the many simple ways, because although we trusted what happened with um, the the no scan and all those, you know, the 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 other websites that said Windows wasn't detected, the tail of the tape is actually that the anti scan was right. So what we're going to do is test, and this is just a quick way to test is open up a web server, drop the file in. In the real world, you probably won't have a lot of executables to send in the executable. Uh, you'll probably hide it in the JPEG or a different particular file or um, have the extension PHP or something. And we'll get into that. I just want to kind of walk you guys through the process of creating malware, the headaches of it, and then how do you tweak it? And then to show you what a power user would do versus somebody that just started out. So the file, I clicked on it, say file. So this is just the windows and click run anyway. And guess what happened? Antivirus found it. Let's see what it says. All right. So it says Trojan Win32, whatever the hell this is. Let's compare it to virus total, what virus total will say. One thirty-two, right? So virus total found it, but this guy was like, "Oh, it's clean. There's no distributor just crapped out on us." Let's reset the page. So this is the reason why you want to always test it on the actual system, right? Because when the bad guys create these files and this infrastructure, they have their own infrastructure. And this is how, when you see people are talking about in the news where, oh yeah, this is from Korea. Well, how do you know it's from Korea, North Korea, or South Korea, or China, or Russia, or even the US NSA? Because they have different types of signatures and different things that they actually use, right? Uh, but they test this stuff. So most companies or, or, or countries, they test their code. So I heard one guy at a, a speak at a conference said the difference between Russian hackers and Chinese hackers is that Russians just want to hack. The Chinese hackers look at who they're going to blame first, looking at specific signatures to paint the picture of another country, right? So these are the things you want to actually think about. So it doesn't work, right? Now, I knew it wasn't going to work. I tested it again. But this is part of our, none of the ones we actually work work with the um, virus enabled. But we're going to walk through till we actually get to when it actually worked. What I wanted to do was illustrate a couple of things. One, a new program called Veil. Number two, how to install or run a Windows application on a Linux machine. Okay. So the whole purpose is to add new stuff into your tool belt. So now when you go to your, you look at your resume, and I forgot which template we're actually using. But as we increase our skill set, we can always say now we know how to use Veil, Wine, right? So we're just building out excuse me, our skill set. We've actually found out another way to run a handler uh, versus running the multi-handler under MSF console and bringing it all the way up, the whole framework. Now I can use the command line with the resource. We also now figured out, okay, I can take a batch file on executable and tweak and manipulate that. And now I've been exposed to a little bit of PowerShell. So as we progress, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on Python, a little bit of time on PowerShell as well. Primarily start with Python first, and then the rest of our course of what we're going to cover for that particular day. Okay.